By now, you can probably tell that I enjoy reading comics, and my favorite comic is Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, but there's another one that I appreciate, and that's called, I'm not sure if you've heard of it, Asterix and Oblix. Any of you guys heard? Yeah, Asterix and Oblix. Now, um, if you haven't heard of it, it's an old French comic, and uh, its setting is in around 50 BC. And the main characters are Gauls, okay, and, and their enemies are the Romans. And so each comic has typically a couple pretty fun fights between the Gauls and the Romans. And uh, it's a pretty exciting comic. I, I enjoy it. There's a, new, there's a movie that came out, uh, I think, a couple years ago. Uh, but the comics are way better, of course. Uh, one of the characters in the comics is, is the chief of the, of the village, the Gaul village. And he doesn't really play a very important role. Uh, but his name is Vital Statistics with an X, and uh, very clever, of course. Uh, but he doesn't play, he's not a very main character in the books, but every story, every book, opens uh, by stating his one and only fear. He's got one fear, this, this chieftain, and his one and only fear is that the sky may fall on his head tomorrow. At the beginning of every story, it states that. It, it states that his only fear is that the sky may fall on his head. Now, I did a little bit of research this week uh, to see sort of where the author got that from. And, and it looks like that there's historical reference to that, that when Alexander the Great was conquering through uh, those lands, he approached some chieftains and, and found out as he encountered them that their only fear was that the sky would fall on their heads. And so the, this comic is sort of playing off of that a little bit. The sky might fall on their heads. Now, we, we may laugh at the absurdity of that fear, um, but is it all that crazy? Now, literally, literally, uh, it might be crazy, but I think that we've all at some point uh, thought of the future as the sky falling on us, haven't we? We hear things going on in the world, and we think sort of in this grand sort of metaphor that the sky is falling down. Each, of, each week, it seems like we encounter a new tragedy, isn't it? We, we hear of Toronto with 10 dead. Uh, before that, just the previous sort of week, 10 days, we have Humboldt with 15 dead. And you could go on and on if you talk about Las Vegas or Florida in, past, in the past year. And we have these tragedies that we see. What's coming next? What's coming next? Or maybe the sky seems to be falling when we think about uh, or consider the decisions of our politicians. It doesn't take long for us to turn on the radio and we, we hear of some of these, the economic decisions that are going on around us in our province, in our country. Uh, religious freedom, as we've, we've talked about, it seems to be uh, more and more curtailed. And, and there's pressure to abandon biblical beliefs and practices. Or maybe the sky is falling, seems to be falling, in the relationships of the people that we know. We pick up the phone and we hear of another relationship uh, that's been broken. Or even relationships that, uh, our own relationships. Marriages crumbling, uh, friendships lost. And we think, we hear of loneliness. A lonely person after lonely person. How should we respond? Many of us are, are worried about the future. Many of us... Uh, struggle with how to act today and how to think today when we think about the future. Right? We have a couple options. Do we, do we retreat and plug our ears and just sort of pretend that things aren't happening? Or do we, we jump in and, and grab a sign and a bullhorn? What, are, what do we do? How do we approach the future when we're worried about it? And this morning we're going to take a look at an example of, of what believers are called to do uh, concerning our hope and our future. And we're going to find this in, in Ruth chapter 3 this morning. It's our text this morning, Ruth chapter 3. And as, as we listen this morning, we'll notice three ways that the characters in our text respond to the future. Three ways that they respond concerning the future. And the first can be seen in Naomi. Naomi in the first couple verses. Let's pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 3. One day, Naomi, her mother-in-law, mother said to her, My daughter, should I not try to find a home for you where you will be well provided for? Is not Boaz, with whose servant girls you have been, a kinsman of ours? Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. 
Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he's finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. We ended chapter 2 and we, we noticed how God uh, had, had given guidance, was guiding and, and providing grace to Naomi and Ruth. As, uh, especially when they had, that they had nothing. They returned from Moab and they had literally nothing. And God guided them and was gracious to them in the midst of that. And through, through divine coincidence, if we want to call it that, God provided Boaz. He, he led them to the field of Boaz, uh, who was a wealthy and an upstanding citizen of Bethlehem. And not only that, he was a relative of Naomi's. And he was very gracious with them. And he uh, seems to have taken a liking to Ruth at the end of chapter 2. And then chapter 2 ends. But, but as chapter 3 begins, we notice that nothing has come of it. We're sort of wondering, like, you know, at the end of chapter 2, it seems like things are going good. And then all of a sudden, as chapter 3 begins, we're like, well, nothing sort of seemed to come of it. There's been no noticeable change between Boaz and Ruth or their relationship. But there has been a change in Naomi. And it's interesting because in chapter 1, she was blind to God's care for her in providing her with Ruth. You remember she went to Bethlehem and she said, I, I went full and I came back empty. And she was bitter. And in her bitterness, it blinded her to a daughter standing right beside her that she had. And and here we see that that, uh, in verse 1 of chapter 3, we find something uh, quite interesting. One day, Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not try to find a home for you? My daughter. She's starting to, the blinders are starting to come off. The bitterness is starting to fade. And Naomi's starting to see uh, God's provision and grace for her in a new daughter. And we notice something else here as well. Back in, in chapter 1, if you flip back a page, chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, we notice that Naomi prays for her daughters-in-law. This was before uh, Orpah and Ruth, uh, or before Orpah had left on their way back to Bethlehem. And Naomi prays this. She, she said to her da- two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you, as you have shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. To find rest in the home of another ha- husband. She prays to the Lord that her daughters-in-law, both Orpah and Ruth, would find rest in the home of another husband. That's her prayer for Ruth. That's, that is a concern. Now, now, Naomi is worried about the future of her daughters here, of her daughters-in-law. So she prays. And then at the beginning of chapter 3, what do we find Naomi doing? Well, she begins to answer her own prayer for the future, doesn't she? You notice that, that in, in, in chapter 3, verse 1, My daughter, should I not try to find a home for you? That word home is actually the exact same word for rest that we find in, in chapter uh, 1. In her prayer, should, should I not find a, a place of rest for you where you will be well provided for? She initiates, and this is something that we see in Naomi, concerned about the future. Naomi initiates. Naomi's prayed to God for the, uh, concerning the future of her daughters, the future, of, future security of Ruth, but she doesn't just leave it there. No, she senses an opportunity for for her to answer that prayer, and she initiates. She makes a plan. She sets up a a, a strange blind date with Ruth and Boaz, which we'll get to in a moment. But she seizes the opportunity to act. I think this points to a reality we experience sometimes. A fear of the future can cause us to freeze. Fear of the future can cause us to freeze. We may see a need, but we hesitate. For a moment. Uh, it's sort of like one of my, my youth kids uh, back in the day uh, praying for one of their classmates at school. And, and they were praying that their classmate would find a friend. They were praying that their classmate would find a friend. So he waits for God to send them a friend. Sometimes uh, we justify our hesitation, our passivity with excuses. Maybe an excuse, you know, we don't want to force the issue. 
Or, or maybe that, you know, well, it, now it's, it's up to God to answer that prayer. Well, it is. But, but Naomi, we see here, she initiates. She, not in spite of God, but because of him. She, she prays for something and sees an opportunity. God presents her with an opportunity to answer that prayer. And so that's what we see in some of her instructions to Ruth here in these first couple verses. And then we have this strange date, and it's interesting. In fact, even distanced by uh, thousands of years and, and a different culture, we can still pick up the potentially scandalous nature of this meeting, can't we? Let's read in verse 7 of what's going down. When Boaz had finished drinking or eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man, and he turned and discovered a woman lying at his feet. It's interesting how the narrator all of a sudden calls them the man and the woman, sort of inviting us into this a little bit. Who are you? he asked. I'm your servant Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a kinsman redeemer. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman of noble character. In order to understand what's going on here a little more fully, we have to enter into or get caught up a little bit more in ancient Israelite culture. Now, the first thing that we need to notice of what Ruth is actually doing here is that it's sort of symbolic of a marriage proposal. Symbolic of a marriage proposal. It's sort of like uh, a strong suggestion of an engagement. Maybe, men, you had this in your relationship uh, where you were sort of prompted, now is the time, uh, whether it was by uh, your wife-to-be or a mother-in-law or however it worked out. Um, but th- this, is, this is an engagement, and it's evident by, by Ruth's symbolic request in verse 9 that he would spread the corner of his garment over her. But it's also important to notice that this isn't the typical way that it's done. This was not the normal way of doing things. In fact, it's a little sketchy. It's a little sketchy. It's a little risky. You know, if they were caught, there would be serious ramifications for both of them. Boaz is a wealthy, sort of upstanding uh, gentleman of Bethlehem. And this would probably cause people to wonder about his character a little bit. Uh, Ruth, even more so, she could be seen and treated as a, as a prostitute. You could see sort of the headlines, you know, wealthy man victimized by Moabite seductress or something like that. And the gossips in town would probably have a, a field day, right? So there's suspense Uh, as we read about this risky rendezvous that's happening here. How's it going to turn out? But in the midst of this, in the midst of what's going on, Ruth shows another act of sacrificial love. And we see, we get a hint of it in how Boaz responds. Uh, But in Israel, society was separated into sort of three different levels. We have, uh, well, I guess we have the nation, but then we have the tribes. Twelve tribes, it's separated into twelve tribes. And then each tribe was separated into clans. And then each clan was separated into families. And so we have this sort of uh, tiered system. And in the midst of that, we have a role called the kinsman redeemer. We've encountered that a couple times in our text. Uh, and, and it was at the clan level. Okay? It was at the clan level. And it would fall to the closest male relative uh, to, to restore ownership of, of lost property uh, or, or to protect the clan's uh, property and interests. And so in Leviticus 25, we won't go there, but it gives some examples of kinsman redeemer, of a kinsman redeemer restoring ownership of a lost clan property, of a field. Let's say uh, uh, someone loses their land because they're poor. Uh, Well, then a kinsman redeemer from their clan, a close male relative, uh, could buy it back. And so it stays within the clan. Or maybe a clansman goes through a rough time and he actually ends up being a slave. Well, we read in Leviticus 25 that a, a, a kinsman redeemer can purchase him back and, and restore him. Another uh, role seems to be marrying a widow of a clansman who's died in order to carry on his family's name. And, and this is what Ruth proposes here. 
And, and it's a sacrifice. Because, well, let's read in verse 9 again what's going on. He, he asks her, this is great, who are you? That's probably one of the best questions in the middle of the night. Who are you? <laughs> I'm your servant Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me since you are a kinsman redeemer. There she's invoking the kinsman redeemer, okay, invoking that, that role. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. Concerned about the future, Naomi, or Ruth, risks sacrificial love. You see, Boaz knows that Ruth has other options. Other options that might make her more happy. Uh, She could have married for love and and married maybe some poor uh, young uh, guy in the fields that she met. That's what he means by whether poor. She could have married for wealth. She could have married someone who had more money than Boaz. If that's what she was in for. If that's what she wanted. But instead, uh, Ruth, or Ruth marries for her family. She marries for her family. For Naomi, specifically. And we, we see that uh, Ruth devotes in this. She sets aside her personal preferences. And, and shows sacrificial love in choosing Boaz as a kinsman redeemer. Now, why is this so uh, sacrificial? Well, it's because her, her potential firstborn son would now become Elimelech's heir, Naomi's husband's firstborn. It would become, Naomi, in effect, Naomi's son. And so what she's committing to is she's devoting her firstborn son to rescue Elimelech's line from extinction. And that's what she's doing when she, when she proposes to Boaz and calls him a kinsman redeemer here. Ruth is showing sacrificial love in choosing Boaz. And it's risky. It's risky. Now, this is so counter or or opposite of what we're taught and what uh, is preached to us by our culture all around us. I need to look out for me, right? It's it's about me and, and what's best for me, my preferences. And whatever commitments, my commitments, are only binding in so much as they further or benefit me. My job, I can toss it if it's not, if it's not going to be about me. If it's not favoring me, my friendships, maybe marriages even, and so on. If they aren't what I want, then it's right for me, it's only right for me to discard them and find what I want. And here we find an example that, that's so opposite that. It's choosing what's best for someone else. Choosing what's best for someone else and sacrificing, a sacrificial love. A love that costs you. And we see it in Ruth. So concerned about the future, we find Naomi initiates. Ruth sacrifices. And then we see Boaz trusts. Boaz trusts. Look in verse 12. Although it is true, this is Boaz still speaking, although it is true that I am near of kin, the, near of kin there is a kinsman redeer, redeemer nearer than I. This is where the readers would all gasp. Oh, no. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to redeem, good. Let him redeem. But if he's not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before any... Uh, got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, don't let it be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. And she did show, so he poured into it six measures of barley and put it on her. Then he went back to town. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, how did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, he gave me these six measures of barley saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens. For the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. Concerned about the future, Boaz trusts in the Lord. That's not to say that Naomi and Ruth don't trust in God, but that Boaz's trust stands out here. It stands out here. Firstly, Boaz trusts the Lord in acting honorably. Did you notice that? As readers, at the end of verse 11, or verse 10, we get the sense that wedding bells are about to ring, right? It's going to happen. We're going to have the wedding, and and Ruth and Naomi, it's all going to be taken care of, and we're going to live happily ever after. 
But here we find Boaz reveal an unexpected fact. There's a closer male relative to Naomi, someone who has the right to serve as kinsman redeemer for Elimelech. And this presents the final major conflict of the story. This is where we have the tension. What's going to happen? Is, is this other man going to redeem? Or is Boaz going to redeem? Now, Boaz didn't need to do this. He could have tried to go around the law. He could, have, he could have said, okay, let's get hitched and dealt with the consequences later. He totally could have done that. Or he could have, you know, uh, maybe, maybe said, okay, we'll do it. I'm just going just to pay a little bit on the side to this man, to my relative, and just smooth things over and it's going to be fine. But Boaz doesn't do that. He, he shows his trust in God by acting honorably. And secondly, he shows his trust in God by, by promising future fulfillment. See, by acting honorably, Boaz knows that the outcome can only be the Lord's. At the beginning of the chapter, we have Naomi, and, and she's answering this prayer, uh, this opportunity. And, and you notice she sort of coordinates, like women do quite well, all the details. This is what you need to do. This is what you need to put on. This is what you need, you know. And she has it going pretty well and planned out. And, and so she's sort of organizing it. But, but by acting honorably, Boaz knows that the outcome's the Lord. Look in verse 13. He says, stay here for the night. And in the morning, if he wants to redeem, good. Let him redeem. But if he's not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. I will do it. Because of this closer kinsman... If Boaz and Ruth were to marry, it would only be because of the Lord's intervention. It could only be because of God. Only he could allow that to happen. It's nothing that Naomi could instruct. This is where the the plan, all the instructions, all the details have to fall off. right? Her detailed instructions can't control this other man. And Boaz can't guarantee that this is going to happen. Right? So Boaz sends Ruth back with with more barley and goes to present the situation to his relative. So concerned about the future, we find Naomi initiates, Ruth sacrifices, and Boaz trusts the Lord. So how might we respond today? Well, be, be an answer to prayer. Be an answer to prayer, even your own. Be an answer to prayer, even your own. See, God works through the sacrificial love of his people as they're loving one another, as they're loving others, to restore their hope and secure their future. We saw that with Naomi in her prayer in chapter 1, didn't we? Uh, As she senses an opportunity that is presented for her to, to answer her own prayer. That God would be involved in that, allow her to work through her. But we also see it in Boaz. In chapter 2, verse 12, Boaz prays that the Lord might, be, might reward Ruth uh, and, and he says in, 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 te- in verse 12, may, the Lord, may you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. And he prays for this reward to happen, that you would be richly rewarded. And, and this symbolism of being under the wings of Yahweh uh, is, is the same word, or comes from the same word that we find in verse 9 of our chapter. Where, where Ruth invites him to spread the corner of his garment over her. It's the exact same word that we have in Hebrew. And Boaz, in verse 11, promises her that if he can, he will do it. He will do it. Here we have another, another wish, another prayer that is being answered by the characters in the story. Prayed to God, answered by the characters. As, as it sees, God presents an opportunity. You notice that it's another example of prayer. It's not just throwing up. But it's seized as God presents an opportunity for it to be answered. So I want to encourage you to be an answer to prayer, even your own. Be an answer to prayer, even your own. What, what are you concerned about for the future? Maybe you're concerned about uh, the next generation. <clears throat> you look around at your kids, you look at your grandkids, maybe great-grandchildren, and you can't believe that the world, uh, the world they might have to live in. So you pray. And rightly so, and continue to do that. But maybe look or start looking for opportunities that, that God might bring along for you to become an, an answer to that prayer. Maybe um, trust God by taking a risk and getting to know one of the younger people, whether it's in the church or in your community, one of your neighbors. Getting to know some youth. Ask Paige. Ask Paige if there's a kid who would like to be discipled. 
But begin to recognize the opportunities that God is giving you to answer the very prayer you're praying. Or maybe the sky is falling when it comes to the sad news that comes up on our news feeds every day. The news of, of, of loss that seems to just continually come and roll. Maybe pray and keep your eyes out for loss around you. Pray to God that, that he would be with these families that are suffering loss, but also be aware of the loss around you and how you might be able to answer that prayer in just a life that's nearby, a life that's close to you. And be ready, because God is. God is ready to answer that prayer. Last week, it's funny, you know, in front of you, I made the suggestion that, oh, you know, if, if, uh, if you're walking and you notice someone who's, who's down on their luck, who's not, uh, maybe doesn't have a lot of means, maybe a homeless person, take them out, buy them some food. Well, wouldn't you know it, or if we want to use the words in, in chapter 2, as it turned out, the very next day, as a family, we're walking along, and, and God gave us an opportunity to answer that prayer, to live out what I'm preaching, so to speak, right? The very next day. So as you pray, keep your eyes open for God to give you opportunities and to work through you. Be an answer to prayer, even your own. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are a God who answers prayer. We thank you that we can come before you because of the blood of your Son and tell you what's going on and petition you and plead before you, cry out to you, God. We thank you for that privilege. It's not by anything we've done, but by the grace that we've received in your Son. But God, as we pray, we pray that you would open our eyes to see the need around us as we pray for things, as we pray for our neighbors, for our community, for our country, God, that you would give us opportunities to answer those prayers, that you would work through us, that you choose to do that, Father, that that's how you act. We praise you for that. So as a, as a church, we pray for those opportunities. As individuals, as followers of you, we pray with open eyes, God, and how you might use us to further your kingdom. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen.